Tonight, though, we're excited to continue Front Lines of Archaeology, and I'm pleased to introduce Dr. Rick Payne. Dr. Payne is a bioarchaeologist, a paleodemographer, and an associate professor of anthropology right here at the University of Utah. Rick has been a member of the University of Utah's faculty since 1996. He earned his undergrad degrees in anthropology at McGill University in, Mon in Montreal, my old stomping grounds, kind of. I'm from northern Vermont. Uh, and, uh, his <laughs> and his master's and doctoral degrees in anthropology and anthropology and demography at Penn State University. Rick is broadly interested in the relationships between people and their environments over time. Uh, his research asks the critical questions of how humans have influenced their environments and vice versa. By examining the interactions among human populations, land use, ecological change, and focusing on patterns of uh, things like ancient disease epidemics. And he's studying the, the impact of, on human dem demography and human life history. Although Rick has conducted archaeological research in the old world, his focus primarily is in the new world in pre-classic Maya centers in Central America. Tonight, Rick's presentation is titled, Doomed by Success, Innovation, Growth, and Climate Change at Angkor and Tikal. Dr. Rick Payne. Thank you, I'm so glad you're here. Um, so I'd like to start with a little quick set of um, uh, shout outs or acknowledgements. Um, so three people whose work and whose um, inspiration or, or collaboration have um, ha meant a lot to what I'll be talking about tonight. Um, so the first one is um, Vern Scarborough. So Vern Scarborough is a, um, he's a, a, the archaeologist who I would say is most responsible these days for um, helping us to understand um, the management of water, um, especially in the Maya area, but he's also worked in, in places like um, Chaco Canyon and, and Angkor. Um, and uh, he's been, um, well, I, I will rely on his work heavily. Um, the second is one of my colleagues at the U um, in geography, Andrea Brunel. Um, part of the reason for this talk is a class that she and I have been developing over the last few years, um, where we're um, trying to examine um, for our students the relationship uh, between a handful of initially very successful societies that in the face of, um, of changing climate, um, well, they didn't make it. Um, and um, so, um, she has a lot, of, even though she doesn't know it, she has a lot of impact on, on the talk that we're going to do tonight. And the last one is a, a colleague of both of ours, Richard Hansen, who, if I get that far in the, um, in the talk, which might not happen, um, then um, some field work that, that we're doing, um, he has very much made possible, and, um, and he's a, an ongoing collaborator there. And his work, uh, among other things, with this land water um, population uh, relationship at an earlier site in the uh, northern Paten called El Mirador um, is, again, uh, very informative uh, of what we're um, doing here. And we might get to it, man, honestly, we might not, um, but we'll see. And so, so those are the um, just acknowledgements early on. Okay, the next thing I want to do before I get going and yes, I will get going, um, is I want to give you the punchline for the talk now. And I know, I know. Um, no, 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 because I, 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 I want you to be thinking about it as we go. And so the punchline in here is we're looking at two societies that one can see them as failed, and that's a, a way that they're probably seen in a lot of ways. And so, you know, you go to the Angkor exhibit and they talk about Angkor as, as um, a city that no longer exists. Um, if you think about the Maya generally, and Tikal in particular, but the Maya generally, 
most people think about them as a society that collapsed. And what I want you to be thinking about, though, is these are two very, very successful, very, very innovative societies. So not only did they survive for a very long time, so in each case, the heyday for each of these is about 600 years long. And in that time, they each took their local environment and, <clears throat> and were able to um, alter it, exploit it in ways that allowed them to do some of the magnificent we'll, I'll, pictures of, but also to have large, successful populations for hundreds of years. And, um, and, and what I would say to that, looking around, is we should be so lucky or so innovative. And so that's what I, that's what I want you to be thinking about with this. I don't want you to, I mean, we're going to talk about them coming apart. Let's be clear, that's going to be the big section. But the part that I want in your brain is this idea that, um, that these are societies that were extremely successful for a very, very long time. Okay, let's see if this thing works. Yeah. So anyway, our, our two societies, as you know, are Angkor on the um, left and, and um, Tikal. Um, and just for a little bit of quick dating. So Tikal was actually established around 25, 2600 years ago. But it really came into its own around 1800 years ago. So if you're thinking in, in contemporary calendar, you know, around um, 200 um, or a little thereafter. It's, like I said, it was very, very successful for about 600 years and sometime in the range of 800 or a little bit thereafter, uh, the wheels came off. And, and sorry. <laughs> sorry, my wife is laughing in the audience because she knew that I would be doing that. Um, anyway, um, uh, Tikal came apart um, like I said, around uh, 1,200 years ago, around 800, and was essentially abandoned and remained so until um, it was, um, people started seeing it again in the 19th century. And even today, well, today it's in a park, but without the park itself, there, there might not be anybody there now. Angkor... On the other hand, Angkor's time really picks up just as Tikal's is falling off. So around 1,200 years ago, Angkor rises up, uh, very, again, very, very successful for about 600 years. Um, and somewhere in the range of um, 650 or so years ago for a new set of related reasons, the wheels come off there. Um, and so that's, that'll be our, our time frame. Uh, our spatial frame, for those who haven't, and, and here is the, um, the influence of, of working with a geographer, um, who in our classes, the first thing she does at any day is say, okay, where are we? So, so in a larger map, Tikal is gonna be right about there. And if we, whoops, if we pull it in, then Tikal is here. What you can't see on this, this map is the, um, the one lake in the area, Lake Petenitsa. We're just north of, of there. And in a space where it is important to note, you have um, basically no permanent year-round surface water. And, and that'll be a, a thing that we'll get to. Okay, Angkor on the other hand, is going to be right about there. And so, so Southeast Asia and 
if we pull it in a little bit, it'll be right up here. And note, a lot more surface water here. The, the Tonle Sap, it's important to note, or interesting to note, this is a body of water that triples in size during the, the rainy season. It just explodes during the rainy season. And then it pulls back um, during the dry season. And that changes the overall ecology of the space and, um, and plays a, a big role today in the uh, um, economy um, of the space. Okay. So anyway, moving forward. Sorry, I don't have to do that. Um, so the Maya, and, and I should say, I am to some extent using Tikal as uh, an avatar of the Maya, generally. And so a lot of what I'm, I'll be saying has to do with and, and, um, and would work for Maya sites all over the region. So um, the, the sites where I worked um, and, um, and others all around, they face a lot of the same issues, the similar kinds of ecologies, and um, for um, purposes of, of well, uh, giving an, a one-hour lecture instead of 15 weeks of it, um, uh, we're going to focus on, on Tikal. The Maya, then, well, they are known, right? And so we see with the Maya, get out of the way, um, the um, architecture, of course, is, is something that is well known, especially the architecture of Tikal. Now, one of the things I want you to imagine here, or be thinking about here, is these, first thing, is these buildings, when Tikal was active, would have looked entirely different. So they would have been painted in bright colors. Uh, the Temple One here um, was, uh, was painted a bright kind of orangey red um, with, with Smaller painting up at the top, and wow, when I turn my head, it gets louder, doesn't it? Um, and so, so you, the, you, the um, roof comb would have been brightly painted, um, and so, and all of the buildings around it the same way. So lots and lots of color. The second thing is the space immediately around it. The ground would have been uh, a plastered-over um, plaza. And so this is a, a fully built environment because the third piece, of course, is you wouldn't have been seeing trees. So there would have been, if we were facing just as the picture is, about 100 yards to the right, there would have been one of the only groves of trees in all of Tikal um, because everything would have been either residential or in farmland by, by the end. And, um, and I'll, we'll talk about that, um, that little um, grove of trees um, in a few minutes. So the Maya are also known uh, for their art, right? So you have I'm not very good at this. <laughs> so you know, painted art. Um, not only painting on, on things like pottery, but painting on walls, um, just uh, um, where it's preserved, just tremendous um, uh, bright, um, intricate art. Uh, carved art, again, this is not from Tikal, this is from Copan, I get to say it this time. Um, and the reason I chose to do Copan is because the sculpture at Copan is just way better than it is at Tikal. Um, but anyway, so, so we get sculptural art, you get painted art, we get lots of architecture, and really importantly, have writing. So the Maya had a writing system of their own. It was a writing system, I should say, that was capable of conveying in script anything that a Maya person could say. So it had a phonetic component, just like the Latin alphabet that we use does, and it enabled um, anything that we could, the, a Maya person could say could be written in the script. Um, and so we don't know where it went, 
So unfortunately for us, we have a handful uh, of Maya books. We have some writing on pottery and we have a lot of writing in stone. And the right and those media are very, very limited. And so, well, think about it. Think about where you have writing in stone in Salt Lake City. Not terribly informative, right? So, birth dates, death dates, the great um, achievements of a tiny number of men and maybe one or two women. Um, and, and that's kind of it, right? This building was erected on such and such a date. This person did something really important in a war in, on such and such a date. This person was born and died on such and such a date. And that's kind of all we've got. And if you look all around the world, so if you look at Rome, ancient or modern, you look at Washington, D.C., you look at pick a city and think about what is written in stone. And it's always the same thing. And so we have no idea just how far the Maya took this. So like I said, they could have written novels, they could have written plays, they could have written extensive histories, um, but this doesn't survive in, in the rainforest environment, and so we'll probably never know. And the, at the same time, the Maya also had a numerical system that I would argue, I won't do it tonight, but I would argue is more elegant than the system that we use. It has all of the capabilities that we have, but fewer symbols to, to make them work. Um, and, you know, tremendous um, knowledge of astronomy and such. And so, um, so a lot that this um, society has um, to offer. At the same time, it is important to note, the Maya fought wars just like everybody else. Um, they were led by hereditary leaders like this guy, again, from Copan, because the sculpture is better. Um, but uh, the Maya, like I said, just like every other society, as far as we can tell, anywhere in the world, they were plagued by warfare. Um, and just like us. Okay. On the other hand, oops, and that's saying goodbye to Tikal. On the other hand, we have um, the Khmer in Angkor. Once again, a society that did tremendous things with architecture, tremendous things with art, um, had, interestingly, a society that was dominated by more than one religion. And so you had, at different times, you had uh, branches of Hinduism and branches of, uh, of Buddhism, uh, sometimes more emphasized than others, but both um, uh, coexisting in the same place. You have just tremendous um, planned constructions. Planned constructions uh, we don't see so much in the way of building. We see religious buildings in Angkor, but we don't see um, the kinds of um, elaborate or not uh, residential buildings in, in Angkor that we do in a place like Tikal. The reason for that is um, the Khmer believe that only religious buildings should be built in stone. And, um, and residential and, um, and commercial um, structures should all be made of wood. And so their foundations exist for us, but in terms of structure, very, very little for us to look at.
uh, like the Maya, the, um, the Khmer were plagued by warfare. Um, they they um, went off and, uh, well, Tikal, I should say, tried hard to build itself a little teeny tiny empire. Um, the Khmer, they had a big one. Um, and, and so that part is different. Like Tikal, um, the Khmer were led by hereditary um, rulers who once again, um, and like at, at Tikal, um, were actual participants, at least to some level, in those wars. And so they did not sit back in their palace and, and send young men off. They went with them, um, which is, again, a change. Okay, so together then, Um, some things that these groups have in common. First thing to note is we're talking in both cases about tropical rainforest environments, and we'll get back to that soon. Other things they hold in common. So you have, and, and the, in here the, the image is, is from Angkor, but you have uh, marketplaces um, in both. Now I should say they have never found the marketplace at Tikal. But what they have found is similar marketplaces at other Maya sites. And there is, um, given Tikal's size, there is um, no reason to believe that if they looked in the ways that they have looked using chemical analyses um, at other Maya sites, that they wouldn't find a marketplace at, um, at Tikal. Um, the images then, uh, on the one hand, we have um, the freezes from the biome, um, which help us with um, some of these kinds of scenes um, at Angkor. But we also have, um, well, one ethno-historic document, um, a, a Chinese merchant who spent time um, in Angkor, and he describes things like the marketplace. Um, another thing technologically based is um, in both cases, you're talking about architecture based on corbelled arches rather than true arches. Um, and this is limits both of them in terms of the kinds of structures they could, they could produce. Um, both are heavily dependent on a single crop, or sing, um, so a single staple crop. In the case of the Khmer, it's, uh, it's rice. In the case of the Maya, it's maize. But in each case, something on the order of 80, 85% of the calories coming from a single plant. Um, and so um, a lot of ways these societies are, are alike. Uh, they are, uh, have some important differences though. The first one is metal technology. So the, um, a, uh, the Khmer, they appear to have bought most of their iron from other peoples but they had a highly well-developed um, uh, bronze casting, uh, metallurgy, and so they had practical metal tools. The Maya did not. There was no practical metal in the Maya region. You had um, uh, um, native copper, work in gold and silver, uh, where, the, um, where there was no smelting involved, but no practical metal. And those metals that they did have Again, all are, are way too soft to, um, to actually um, use in a practical way. So you had metal as art a little bit, uh, bells and things like that, but very, very little. Um, the next one, I will get used to this by the time things are over, um, is draft animals. So the Khmer had the labor of multiple draft animals. The two really important ones being water buffalo and elephants. Um, and water buffalo being the major uh, draft animal, traction animal that you have um, uh, available. And the Maya did not. So the Maya had no large domesticated animal that could be used to pull a plow, pull a cart, lift a load. And, and, and I do want to note, 
Draft animals are not only important for their strength, they're important for the way they process energy. So the fact of the matter is that you can take your water buffalo and you can feed it things, you can fuel it with things that are not human food. And, and that makes them cheap to, um, to um, employ. And they were able to do that with a, a practical wheel. And again, in Mesoamerica, generally in the Maya area, no practical wheel. They understood the wheel. We have toys that go back more than 3,000 years in the area that employ wheels. But there was never any practical wheel use um, in the Maya area. And I, I focus on these things because the last really important difference between these two places is scale. So Angkor is probably an order of magnitude bigger than Tikal. So, um, you know, where Tikal is going to have a population in the perhaps many, but tens of thousands of people, Angkor is going to have a population in all likelihood in the several hundreds of thousands of people. And that's a significant difference. That's a difference that affects politics. That's a difference that affects economy. That's a difference that affects every aspect uh, of society. And so this is very, very critical difference between the two. OK. And then the, just coming back, um, I've already given you the dates off of this. Um, but the thing I wanted to remind you of one more time is in both of these cases, these are long-lived societies. They are, um, by any reasonable measure, these are societies that are very, very successful. They, they grew large populations, and they maintained them for many centuries. OK. So the other thing that they have in common is they both have to deal, had to deal, with a tropical rainfall pattern. So in each case, what that means, so here's uh, monthly rainfall for um, the nearest city to Tikal, nearest town to Tikal, and come on, and monthly rainfall um, for the, um, that um, state that, um, that Angkor sits in. And what you see in each case is a markedly seasonal rainfall pattern, right? So you have a dry season and you have a, a rainy season. And these are very predictable, but they leave in both cases extended periods where rainfall is not sufficient to do agriculture or not sufficient to do agriculture in the staple crops that they're growing. And in both cases, given the population sizes that you're talking about, in both cases, you're looking at, um, in the dry season, the potential for water shortage. Um, Sorry, I had one of those before you all got here, and it just about blew up the building. Um, so, um, anyway, um, the management of water becomes this really critical issue in the growth, maintenance, and ultimately survival of of each of these these um, locales. And Beyond that, you know, we're talking about water not just as, you know, um, as, as drinking water, but we're talking about water supply for crops um, and, and water supply for, for home maintenance. So, Tikal, I'll tell you what all this means in a second. Um, Tikal sits in a space, I mentioned this, sits in a space where there is no permanent surface water. So in Tikal, during the dry season, nothing. And this is the reason for this 
is um, primarily underlying geology, and I'm not going to get into it. But what you see in, in, in the area around Tikal is Tikal and other sites in the, in the Paten. They're built on areas of high ground surrounded by these low seasonal swamps called Bajos. And the Bajos, they fill up in the rainy season and they hold water better than the surrounding spaces on the one hand because they're depressions, but on the other because they are full of clays that are, are sediments that have been deposited by erosion. And so they seal a little bit better than the surrounding ground, but not sufficiently so. And so even though you have a water supply that starts to get, well, really ugly during the rainy season, so it just gets horrible. Uh, but as you get into the dry season, it disappears. And so on the one hand, this means no farming without some intervention um, during the dry season. But the other thing that it means is that you have a need for storing water that's going to allow your human population, those several tens of thousands of people that in, live in and around Tikal, to, um, to make it through that dry season. And the responses, once again, are amazing. So this is a map, and, and you'll note it's um, <laughs> produced by, by one of my um, heroes from the beginning of the lecture. Um, and what you have is a whole series of reservoirs. And they are everywhere. And the other thing you have, that I'm not going to talk about very much today, but you also have little mini reservoirs in small residential areas around Tikal also. And so the first thing is the reservoirs themselves. The next fascinating thing, so this is the spot. So I, I showed you that picture of Temple One uh, at the beginning, and it was taken from, so basically the picture was taken from here to here, and I said 100 yards to the, um, to the side, you were gonna have this, um, this reservoir, or you're gonna have the trees. So around the reservoirs, these reservoirs, not the others as far as we can tell, but these particular reservoirs, which also happen to sit right behind the homes of the, the wealthiest people of Tikal, you have this series of reservoirs, and these were surrounded by natural forest. And it's possible that that natural forest was there with the intent of helping to keep those um, reservoirs clean. It's also possible that, that the folks in that palace there thought it would be nice to look at trees. Um, we can't tell. But what they're doing here is like I said, amazing. So I should note, Tikal appears to have been originally built to take advantage of this spring right here. And that seems to have been, the, the, the earliest structures on the site are all in the vicinity of that little spring. What the Maya did to have these reservoirs full actually um, destroyed the spring. Um, so the spring ceases to be important. And, and the reason why it ceases to be important is what they do is they grade the space. So this is better. So this is a LIDAR image of, of downtown Tikal. And so to give you another perspective, so Temple One, the one I showed you the picture of, is here. The, pit, the photo was taken like that, so now we're looking at that palace, and we're looking at the, the spring would have been here, small reservoir here, second reservoir here, here, and so on. Um, what they did was they took all of the central space and, um, and um, they graded it. So the first thing they did was cover it with plaster, but the other thing that they did was they graded the whole space so they channeled the water 
from the entire downtown space into those reservoirs. And so the, it, it channeled it first into to, to feeder channels and then on. And, and that was also how they, how they killed the spring, right? So plastering over that ground, <clears throat> plastering over that ground meant that there was no recharge for the spring, right? And so the spring was, would have been, by the middle of the classic period, the spring would have been dry. But they'd have been channeling water into here, but then the next stage in this is these, and these are the ones that have been well studied, but these um, reservoirs here, they were lined with stucco, with plaster, so that they wouldn't leak. And the last thing that they did is they, control, they, um, they filtered the water. So we're looking at what's going on here is up in here. And what it is, is the space where those feeder channel, those, that feeder water flow has, has channelized the water and before it enters the, the um, reservoirs, it's being filtered. And so on the one hand, they're filtering it with, with plain old sand and, um, and limestone. But the other thing that they're using is an imported sand and it comes from in the range of two to three days walk away and, it, and the sand is, is called zeolite. And don't ask me about the, when we get to questions and answers, don't ask me about the chemistry of this because I cannot answer it. But zeolite has antibacterial properties. And so you, you filter the water through that and you at least start in your, um, in your um, reservoir for drinking water, you start with water that has been on some level disinfected. So the water is disinfected, it's protected, not only held by that plaster, but it's also um, um, kept clean by that. We know that the Maya regularly dredged out these central um, reservoirs, and so this is uh, a drinking water system. At Angkor, the needs are bigger, right? You're talking about 10 times the population. But at the same time, um, at the same time, sorry, I get carried away. Um, I met better go faster. So at the same time, you have a better water environment. So it is the case that this is an area that has rivers and streams running through it. The problem that they run into there is on the one hand, they diminish too far during the dry, dry season and they don't supply enough water. But the other problem is that during the rainy season, they run hard. And they run hard in a way that means that they contribute to erosion and they make it so it's difficult to, um, to um, capture and make use of that water. And so what they did at Angkor is they um, created this massive system. And this is just a little space in, in the center. So Angkor Wat, which is where all the famous pictures are taken, is right here. But if you look outside, you have this tremendous system of canals and storage reservoirs covering the city. And I think, no. Um, and so this system, it starts out really well centrally planned. And so you've got this whole system that what it does is during the rainy season, it spreads the water out and slows it down. And in so doing, it makes it initially available and useful as an irrigation source. But the other thing it does is it, it reduces the kind of danger uh, um, associated with it. But the second thing it does is it transports it to all sorts of places where it can be stored. 
And some of these are little tiny household level pools, and some of them are um, tremendous, you know, um, kilometers long. And so this starts out as this very, very well planned, very nicely organized system. Over the course of time, this changes. So it grows like crazy. So it grows with, on the one hand, the growth of the city, but the other thing that happens is part of the tradition in Angkor was each new ruler was supposed to build himself a new monument like Angkor Wat. And they're plunking these things into the middle of this larger plan system. I think the best analogy for this, and for people who've heard me say this, uh, I'm sorry, but I think the best analogy for this is old northeastern airports. So if you've been through Kennedy or Logan, they're nightmares, <laughs> right? But they're nightmares for a reason. And the reason they're nightmares is because after the initial set of planning, they grew organically. So they needed, you know, this airline needed a new terminal, that airline wanted a new terminal, and they plunked them on without doing anything else, and they create this spaghetti. And this is what's happening at Angkor. And so one of the things that's happening is that this space over the course of time is becoming increasingly um, uh, kludgy. And, and at the same time, because it's so big, it's really hard to manage. So, so repairing it and trying to straighten it out is a Herculean effort and doesn't happen. And so it gets to be more and more uh, disorganized, more, less and less efficient, and, um, and more vulnerable. And so you reach a point at both Tikal and at Angkor where on some level, because of their own success, because they have been so effective at exploiting that agricultural environment, at capturing the maximum amount of water available to support both their agriculture and their populations, where the buffer is gone. So there's no resilience left. And so you reach a point at Tikal, this is somewhere around 800, maybe a little earlier. At Angkor, this is somewhere around 1200. And they're, right, they're teetering right on the edge. They're just right there. They have done everything they can do. There is within their technology, their very, very innovative technology. They, um, like I said, they have no resiliency. They have no buffer. And so, and I know I need to be going faster. Yes, I do. Um, anyway, what you get is a curveball. In each place, you have climate change. And it all revolves around what we call the medieval climate anomaly. The medieval climate anom anomaly lasts from approximately between 8 and 900 until approximately 1200. It has different effects all over the world. So the medieval climate anal anomaly in Europe is a boon. And so it's years and years of longer growing seasons, more um, um, uh, predictable rainfall, and population growth. For the Maya in Tikal, it's a disaster because with it comes drought. In Angkor, it's a long extended period of uh, reliable rainfall. In Angkor, you're not worried about frost season. Um, and so while it is, and I should say, 
And I'm not going to get used to that. There we go. We'll just do it by hand. I'm better at it that way anyway. In this circle, basically starting right around here and going to right around here, that's the medieval climate anomaly. And for Tikal and the Maya, the really critical part is it is actually, it's a, a longer term drying period that is uh, punctuated by this massive drought. And Tikal cannot, Tikal has nothing to get it through it, right? So Tikal has no buffer, no resilience. And that's the result of all that population growth, all that really heavy, heavy exploitation of the local environment, and that maximization of, of water. And now there's no place to go. There's no improvement that can be made, and Tikal collapses. For, see how entertaining I am? <laughs> For Angkor, it's the same except it's the other end. So here is the end of the medieval climate anomaly. And what happens for Angkor is following the end, now they experience two things. The first thing they experience is an overall loss of rainfall. So they have multiple years where the monsoon fails. But those years, and this is going to sound really familiar, um, just ask the folks in California today. Um, Long term, they're facing drought, but it's punctuated by environmental instability. And so it's punctuated by these great big spikes in, in monsoon activity. And so one year you've got low rainfalls, failing rainfall, the next year you've got too much. And overall it's too little, but, but this punctuation stresses the system. So on the one hand, you're losing water. But on the other, you are destroying the system. So this is a little segment of that canal system. And normally, so there's a stone bridge up here, and you've got the normal canals working here, and smaller ones working through. But what happens is, and this happens, this is not the only place where you'd see this, you have all sorts of places where the... Um, the canal system is um, broken up by that combination on the one hand of the erratic rainfall, but on the other by that long-term um, air portification of the system. And so the system is not capable of handling this where a couple hundred years earlier it might well have been. And so you see uh, sediments help with this. So the other thing you see in places like this is a change in the sediments at the floor of this that show us the changes in the speed of water. So every, in Utah, everybody knows about this, right? You look at one of our streams in the, in the mountains and you can tell how steep the slope is by how big the rocks are in the creek bed, right? So this is what's going on here and what archaeologists are seeing here. And so normal sediments are being replaced by gravels. And what this is is water trying to speed through the system. And in so doing, it's breaking it down. And so what happens to Angkor is very much like what happens at Tikal in that the system that brought them so much success breaks down. And so Angkor loses its influence. It doesn't collapse with the speed that, that Tikal does. But what it does do is it loses inf influence, it doesn't get rebuilt, so it loses neighborhoods, and it takes um, Angkor a hundred years or so to go from being the capital of this great empire to being a backwater. 
And, and that's the, the, the change. Okay, I think, I knew that was gonna happen. Anyway, um, I guess I'm not gonna get to talk about my, my third group. Um, I didn't think I would. Um, but anyway, um, the punchline, it's a good thing I told you at the beginning. Here, we've got these extremely, extremely successful, innovative, technologically advancing groups. And that enables them to be hyper successful for centuries. And then, though they reach a point where their resilience is gone because they have been so successful at that. And then when the rules change with climate change, when the rules change, then they're not prepared to deal with it and they can't deal with it. And so in both cases, um, they're um, uh, gone. Okay. Um, all right, that's, that's where I'm gonna stop. Fascinating, fascinating. So uh, we have some time for some questions. We have our uh, uh, microphones being run through with Jane and Dame, uh, uh, Dane and Jamie. So if you have a question, please raise your hand. They'll run a microphone to you so everybody can hear. And here away we go. Can you see? Yeah. I just wanted to make sure you saw him. Is there evidence from either location of attempts to mitigate what was going on or change things in response to the impacts of you know, what you just discussed? Uh, the answer is, the, the really short, easy answer is no. Um, the longer answer is archeologically, the kind of short-term change that you might be talking about might be very difficult to see. And so, the fact that we have that, you know, no, they didn't, doesn't necessarily, well, no, we can't see it is the better answer, um, but we can't. Uh, Goddard Space Flight Center, part of NASA, a few years ago financed a report called, is industrialized civilization headed for irreversible collapse? No one would publish it until finally The Guardian published it. Uh, they went back 5,000 years of human history, the Romans, the Spanish, the Dutch, the French, the English, us, showing how these very sophisticated empires have come and gone. Using the smallest possible depletion rate and a very small number of elites, and currently we have Gates, Bezos, and Musk have more wealth than the bottom 170 million people, the bottom half of America, uh, the society collapses. This is distinguished from a type L collapse where nature collapses. This is a collapse of society. What, what's your view on that? <laughs> wow, that, that's, um, so, I'm gonna dodge that question with a story. Because, because it's way too much for, for now. I, I am scared, I will say, I am, the, the short answer to that, is, is I am terrified of what's happening in the world right now. Um, the story that I would tell you is, is something my, um, a long time ago now, my um, wife and I were sitting in the um, Roman Colosseum. And today, well, then, the major denizens of the Roman Colosseum are cats and tourists. <coughs> Excuse me. But what I was imagining is this is a place that held 60,000 people. And if you had been there on, on the day, uh, you know, in whatever, you know, 150, and you were sitting watching the action below, and you were to turn to the person to your right and say, you know, in 600 years, Rome's population is going to be 20,000 people, and no one's going to care about it anymore. The person beside you would have said, you are crazy. If you did the same thing on a September Saturday at Rice Eccles and turned to your right person on the right and said, we're not going to be here in some number or we're going to be changed, they'd think you're crazy too. That's the end of the story. <laughs> 
but it summarizes my worry. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I was curious about when you're studying the water system here, how much do you know about sewage and, and sanitation? So, in the case of these two, not very much. But one of the places that, that is at least related, where we have some good information, is um, the Aztec capital of Tenochtitlan. So this is, broadly speaking, similar culturally to the Maya, in the way that you know, the Germans and the French are similar to each other kind of thing. <laughs> and at Tenochtitlan, they worked very hard to remove sewage. The way they did it was, um, was capitalism. And so what they had all along the roadsides, you had these little way stations, and you would deposit your um, human waste in these places, and the people who ran these would sell it. And they'd sell it for fertilizer, or they'd sell it for dyeing and tanning. And so, because, because both human byproducts are actually pretty useful. And so, on the one hand, they, they took care of things that way. They didn't have a, a well-developed pipe system or anything, but they did have a means of disposal. The other thing about Tenochtitlan that we can see, that we can't see with a Tikal because of differences in abandonment, but is that the Aztecs, public hygiene really meant a lot to them. And so Tenochtitlan was remarkably clean. And so the streets were swept, the, the debris was taken away, and, and there was a, a, a value placed on, on public hygiene. Whether that spread to the Maya, I don't know, I can't, I can't tell, because when you look at a, an archeological site, you can't see that very well. Archeological sites get cleaned up before people leave all the time. And so we can't really see there. And in the case of Angkor, I have a strong suspicion, but you shouldn't take me anywhere on this one, but that some of those canals and some of those spaces are gonna be dirty. Um, there's, just, there's just too much water moving through there to, to be able to keep, to have you know, a couple hundred thousand people keep it clean. And so I suspect that there's a, a, a significant issue there. But I know of no source that's really able to tell us. Dr. Payne, we have a question up here. Yes, um, please. I know you said not to ask about the zeolite, but <laughs> um, I was just wondering how, how they like figured out, is there any information about how they figured out that it had antimicrobial properties or just like a wild guess? I suspect, again, that this is, this is observation. And so I suspect that Tikal wasn't the first place where they used it. It was probably the case that it was used in similar filterings up closer to where the deposits were, and that people observed that if you used that sand to filter your water, that you, it took longer to have algae in your, um, in your reservoir than if you used regular sand in your filter. And that, that people, because they had no, not, there was no germ theory uh, that in, in, the, in the area. And so they wouldn't have known what they were preventing exactly, but they could well have been able to observe the differences. And, and like I said, I, I suspect strongly that, you know, even though Tikal is where we have the evidence of these zeolite filters, that they're going on all over the place and they probably originated closer to where the deposits are. Quick comment. Um, it was hotter in Roman antiquity than it is today. The changes that you've outlined in your excellent presentation have nothing to do with fossil fuels. I don't think we can, uh, cor we can uh, confuse correlation with causation. And I think we have to look at humans as an animal uh, the animals survived. The political systems didn't. But as you look around, uh, there's plenty of us here. There's plenty of people in the former Mayan world and in the former Roman world and, of course, in Cambodia. So assuming that the political systems of uh, the present world collapse, uh, I still think that uh, humanity as an animal will survive. We're adding 
250,000 uh, new mouths to feed to the planet every day. I, I think there's a big difference between survival and thriving. So the first thing I would note is the population of the Maya region over the course of about 100 years dropped something on the order of, you'll have archaeologists who will argue 90%. I don't think it's that much, but it was a really significant drop. Um, in the case of Angkor, people probably just moved, and to some extent that's probably true with, with a place like Tikal. But there were real demographic effects. The other thing that I would say is the capacity for destruction on the part of either the Khmer or the Maya is um, really pales compared to our capacity. And, and I, that's, I'm not talking about intent. I'm just talking about the fact that when we wreck our environment because we need to have, you know, uh, every, every person in the, in the world these days needs to consume, I don't know how many plastic containers a year. There is a tremendous potential for that to wreak real ecological destruction. So I, I, I agree that the planet is going to go along fine, and I don't think that people are going to become extinct or anything, but I do think that we have a terrible potential, and I'm getting way out above my pay grade here, but <laughs> I think there's a real potential for life to get a whole lot worse. And then we have a question here. Okay. Yes, please. Um, uh, I'm sorry, my glasses are dirty. It's hard, hard for me to see. <laughs> so, uh, so I have a simple question. So you mentioned innovation several times yes. during your lecture. I was wondering if you could elaborate a little bit more what innovative systems there were you know, to build sure. the watering and also to contrast perhaps the two sites and let so, us know how it propagated sure. uh, if we have any of those still available. So, I mean, I, I think the the biggest, most obvious piece of innovation at Angkor is that hydraulic system. So you look at that and, um, and, and you know, there, there are um, travelers who pass through here who talk about Angkor as the Venice of Asia. That's a joke. <laughs> Venice was the Angkor of Europe. I mean, the degree of the, 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 the mileage covered by that canal system, the water that was stored and altered by that water system is phenomenal. And there's just no comparison to, like I said, to what you're seeing in Venice is, is I mean, one little neighborhood of Angkor is Venice. Um, and so, so I, I think that's the best example there. Um, in the, the Maya case, we have agricultural innovations. And so I didn't talk about it, um, but you have um, uh, field drainage systems that are used to turn those, um, those bajo spaces into productive agricultural spaces. You have the kinds of intellectual stuff that we were talking about. So the, that you have a mathematical system, and once again, we are stuck, right? Because the only places where we see the use of Maya numbers are in calendars. But that system could do anything you wanted. And so they could have used that in, in engineering. They, um, other Mesoamerican groups we know did similar things. And so Maya contemporary to Tehuacan in, in central Mexico, uh, the archeologists have been able to reconstruct the measurement system that they used by, by all of the, the, um, the pieces that fit. And so they designed a city around important numbers. Uh, the Maya um, uh, kept track of uh, the astronomical observation. They built buildings that, um, that um, captured um, astronomical phenomena. Um, 
yeah, it's just an incredible range. I, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm letting them do their job. I, I, I see you. <laughs> yes? I know they're both tropical areas, but did salinization happen to come into play in these areas? Like it's happening, like the Tigris and Euphrates River mm -hmm. Valley happened. It's happening in California. It's, it's yes. happening in, any, in the, the Southwest now that, because of the drought so, condition. So you don't have the long-term evaporation issue in these places that you do in um, when you have irrigation of arid spaces. So if you look at, you know, canal systems, like you said, in, in, in Mesopotamia, um, there's tremendous evaporation that's happening there. And so you get salt deposits there. Um, California is the same, the same deal, right? So, so the issue is, is all, it's all about evaporation. It's all about, you take this mineral rich um, water and, and you, um, and you distill it basically through evaporation, right? So the water comes out pure and it leaves those deposits behind and you get the rising salt that you get in, in the Central Valley in California. Um, I've never seen it discussed and I suspect that it's, it's not because it's not the same kind of issue. There. Hi, um, you were saying that in Tikal that some of the earliest um, buildings were around the spring. Yeah. Is there anything like that at Angkor, where like there was like, like why this location? Uh, the so no one that I have read has argued it. So one of the th the big differences between Angkor and and Tikal is when Angkor was small it would, would have had a whole series of streams running through it. You know, it, it, it was part of a riverine system. And so in all likelihood, people built near water, but there wasn't a single, uh, a single permanent source the way there was at Tika. Yes. Uh, to bring this sort of closer to home geographically, yeah. was the medieval climate um, anomaly also responsible for the, the, the um, the loss of the Chaco civilization and some of the Pueblo th three civilizations a little bit later. And I'm curious how much now they think that was weather versus more cultural and other kinds of issues yeah. that happened. So there is a strong argument with Chaco in particular of rainfall patterns changing. And we know that, and, I, and, and being a cause of the abandonment of Chaco Canyon. Um, and it is part and parcel of the same weather, the same climate system. So the medieval climate anomaly happens coincident once again with the, um, with the fall of Chaco. Um, it is also very likely, you know, we have um, uh, subsistence changes with the Fremont right around here that take place again. Um, I, I don't want to go too far because I don't know this area well, but I know that they are coincident with the medieval climate anomaly. So, so I, I suspect, yes. Dr. Payne, thank you for, I'm way over here to your left. <laughs> thank, thank you for coming to speak to us tonight. So um, I find that both Angkor and Tikal are, are the same latitude, we, we, assuming that they're similar in latitude. Mm -hmm. So what other cultures in the world also experience this same kind of change to their climate, which then affected their cultures? So um, there are a couple of big ones in the Mediterranean. So there's this, there's this um, phenomenon that they call the Bronze Age crisis in the Eastern Mediterranean that appears to be, I mean, at different latitude, but appears to be uh, very much about changes in climate. Um, the um, Roman Empire doesn't rise and fall with climate, but its growth period is an earlier set of centuries where you have an extended period of warm and wet. And the decline, the late decline of the Roman Empire, it falls in a, in a um, cool and dry period that precedes the, um, the um, uh, medieval anomaly. And so 
these kinds of changes are things that we can see all over the world. Um, and, um, and so, um, yeah, so there's just, um, yeah, yeah if, if you go out and dig, you can find one after another. Oh, and I should throw in, um, you know, what happens in, so Europe is generally divided, the medieval period in Europe is divided into an early and a late. Um, one can divide it based solely on the, um, the Black Death and before and after, but a better way to think about it really is the early medieval is during the medieval climate anomaly and the late medieval is in what they call the Little Ice Age, which follows it. And, and the conditions in Europe are dramatically changed by, by both. We have time for two more questions, I believe. We have one right here. Okay, hi. Um, so history, we need to look at history to sort of see what's happening today. And we, I, what I'm taking away from this is some demographic impact. <laughs> and um, to bring it even closer, how about Salt Lake? Um, you know, I, I, I just keep thinking, did we not plan for where we're at today and, and look what's happened? So, you know, there's this huge difference between the two societies that I was talking about and us with the Great Salt Lake. And the huge difference is they didn't know what was coming. <laughs> so they, they had no forecasting. And we do. And, and that's the, the, and whether, I'm sorry, I, I'm, I'm gonna really betray my politics and everything else, <laughs> but, but anyway, no, no, so, so, so you know, we, we have been warned. And whether we'll do something about it, whether the Great Salt Lake will exist in, in, um, by the end of a lot of our lifetimes in this room uh, is very much up in the air. And what that will do to Salt Lake is very much up in the air. And I think they said one more. Oh, sure. <laughs> oh works. So you were saying they didn't see what's coming, so there's really nothing they would have done to prevent it or rebuild or re prepare or anything. So they didn't see the climate change coming. What there was, though, was in each case, so the loss of resilience in that hydraulic system in Angkor was something that one could see happening, right? So you could see that there would have been large segments of that that had probably fallen into disrepair or that weren't flowing efficiently because of cha ad hoc changes over time. Mm -hmm. And so there was warning there. In the Maya case, there was absolutely warning. So there was, I mean, not of the climate change, but of trouble. So you had uh, shortening fallow systems in, um, in farming. You had increased rates of, of things that we can see, increased rates of erosion. Um, in all likelihood, you had things like, you know, changes in fire regimes. And so there were signs in the Maya case that society was teetering a little bit. And it, and it, it expresses, I should say, it expresses itself too. So we have evidence of increased um, and more virulent warfare in the years leading up to it. Now, my, a lot of my colleagues who study that warfare, they attribute it to other social factors, but I think it's about resources. And, um, and so we see that kind of pressure increasing. And so it's not like as a Maya person, you would have looked around and not seen anything wrong. You just didn't know that there was this hammer that was gonna drop that was going to, um, to expose all of the problems that you had. Thank you. Well, thank you very much. Oh, my, my pleasure. You virtually assured that I'm never gonna sleep again. Thank you. <laughs>
Listen, uh, thank you all for coming tonight. Really appreciate you uh, supporting this lecture series. I'd like to thank once again our lecture series sponsors and donors, the R. Harold Burton Foundation, the Cultural Vision Fund, Rio Tinto Kennecott, the M. Lazy M. Foundation, the De Fiori Family Foundation, Frog Bench Farms, the Nature Conservancy, Wolf Clark Foundation, as well as the Salt Lake County Zoo Arts and Parks Fund, the Zap Fund. We hope to see you for Alice, uh, Dr. Allison Carter's presentation on Monday, March 20th at the Viridian Event Center in West Jordan, and again on Tuesday, the, 30, uh, the 20th first at NHMU up the hill. Thanks again, Dr. Payne, and thank you all for coming. Thanks.